You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Matt Haig back on the show with me today to talk about his brand new book, The Midnight Library. And uh, I'll tell you what, this book had me uh, from from page one. You know, sometimes there's one of those books where, you know, you read the jacket and you're intrigued by the premise. And in the very beginning, the author delivers on that premise and you're just sucked in and uh the midnight library is one of those books and i'm excited to talk about it today welcome back to the show matt hi nice to be here again hank nice to speak to you once more absolutely um uh, matt we last time you told us this this great fascinating story about um you as a as a young man, um, learning that writing, uh, you know, was could be therapeutic for you in in a way, and that um, you know a, a lot of the things that you uh, wrote uh, were dealing with feelings and and things like that. Um, do, do you have you ever read a book that completely transported you to another place and? Um, made you have this this feeling of empathy with the writer um yeah i mean i I suppose that's what i really uh seek out um when i'm reading books i mean i read uh, a a lot i like reading a lot of memoirs and i've read um a lot of memoirs over the years and i've read some this year there's a a british writer called laurie lee who i like a lot who who um, writes about a place in England called the Cotswolds, and it's a, a very rural area. And and every time you read one of those books, it sort of makes you empathise with him and his childhood, and sends you to this particular place and time. So yeah, I I I love I love that about about books. Sort of sense of deep empathy you get, and where where you sort of like are transported not just to a sort of another land, but into another mind. Yeah, that's why I read it. In the in the inside of the book, uh, the Midnight Library, there's uh, you know when you kind of get past the the front matter of the book, and and right before the the book goes in, there's uh, there's a a page with a a paragraph with a quote, and it says, "Between life and death, there's a library." She said, and within that library, the shelves go on forever. Every book provides a chance to try another life you could have lived, to see how things would be if you had made other choices. Would you have done anything different if you had the chance to undo your regrets? Uh, Matt, do, wh- was that idea? Was that an idea that you had kind of wrestled with for a while? That the idea that there um, are that, that there's a library with every possible choice, like that, that's such a fascinating idea. But when you hear that idea, you're like, oh, oh yeah, of course. That's it, it. Seems so simple on the surface, yet so complex when you really start digging into it. Where did the idea for this library come from? Well, I mean, I always have been inspired by libraries, and I actually think a library in itself, if you think about a library, it kind of already is a kind of portal to other worlds. It's kind of like the perfect metaphor for if you if you're going to write about um parallel lives, I, I felt like a library was um somewhere that already exists like that. You know, it is a sort of entry point to thirty thousand different lives, you know, just by picking up a, a book from a shelf, you you can potentially escape into another world or existence so i thought it would be a great uh portal for this central character nora between life and death to actually have a library as her literal uh, place where she gets to choose which life she wants to live because i I feel like that's what libraries um have kind of been for for me and i'm in the suit you know there are fantastical libraries in um fiction whether you're talking you know game of friends whether you're talking um harry potter or whatever but i think 
for me, the most inspiring library in fiction is in the short story, The Library of um, Babel by um, Jorge Luis Borges, who wrote, he wrote a story about a library which was this infinite space. It wasn't um, parallel lives, but it was a sort of infinite number of books on the shelves. And that sort of, I thought, oh, that would make an interesting, you know, you could, you could take that kind of library and, and give it a sort of, each, instead of each book being a book, each book being a life um, would would be very interesting concept. So that, that's kind of um, my thinking towards um, Midnight Library. In your previous book, How to Stop Time, uh, which we talked about, the the protagonist, uh, Tom was it, Tom Hazard. Um, that that book is obviously from the male perspective with our protagonist Tom, um, but this book is uh, we have a female protagonist. Was was that a conscious effort, or um, you know, as as you envision the story, um, did she just show up? Yeah, pretty much that. I, I actually started writing this book with a male protagonist and i uh, you know I, I often do that as a default because i'm male and it just seems like uh, the logical thing to do but the problem was with this book is that um because it had the themes of mental health so overtly there and because i've written about my own uh, mental health journey from having had depression panic disorder as a younger person um it it felt almost if I, if a central character had been male, it felt almost too like me, and it felt like I wasn't somehow free to write this person uh, as a man. So s- simply switching the gender made it um, made me freer to know that you know I, I definitely overtly wasn't writing about myself. I was writing about a woman, uh, and, and therefore, in a strange way, I could actually put more autobiographical stuff in there in terms of her mental health stuff in terms of her feelings and stuff i obviously had to be very conscious that i was writing about a woman and that she would be treated a bit differently to a male character um but that's more in terms of how people treat her i I gave her a very similar experience of um depression and despair and that feeling of being at rock bottom at the start of the book as how, how i felt at my sort of lowest point and so Strangely, for it being a woman, it actually ended up with more autobiographical stuff. Um, book. That that's really funny, Matt, because you know one of the things that that we invariably do as readers is you know you wonder even as much as you don't want to, but you wonder you know how much of this uh, is actually the writer, how much of themselves did they put in here, and and how uh, vaguely is it uh, masked, uh, you know, and uh, to to say that you switched protagonists so that you could write more freely um, is a little mind blowing. Um, you know, did, did you ever catch yourself going, okay, this is a little too personal. This is, I need some more space from this. Like, like how do you, how do you create the, the safety net uh, as a writer uh, where it, it's not just memoir, you are adding some fantastical fiction between you and the protagonist. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm someone who, who, as well as writing fiction, I've written about my own mental health journey in nonfiction in a book called Reasons to Stay Alive, which at the time I, I felt sort of no one would really notice, but it became, um, you know, widely read in the UK and became a bestseller and stuff. And that was my first bestseller. And it was, uh, therefore, suddenly I was sort of seen as Mr. Depression and People would just talk to me or email me about mental health. And I got scared by that for a little while and wanted to escape it. And I wrote sort of fantasy fiction for children and different different types of things. And then um, I found a sort of comfortable middle ground where I can write about the issues that really are important to me, like mental health, but actually have more freedom in a way doing it via a novel than via a sort of non-fiction memoir or self-help book type of thing. Because within a novel... Um, you you have a novel is such a sort of broad thing as as a genre of an art form. You know, a novel can be almost anything you want it to be. You're not you're not bound by uh, conventions. You're not bound by um, external truth. You can literally go where your mind wants to go. And so I feel like it's a perfect vehicle in a way to explore themes of mental health, the 
to explore, you know, where that optimism comes from, how you find that optimism in your life. And um, so actually, uh, with the Midnight Library, all the mental health stuff felt quite um, comfortable and easy for me to write about because having written about, you know, myself, um, having these experiences to, to actually put it onto another character I felt in a way I could almost be more truthful and more autobiographical for it not being my name not being my gender not being a real flesh and blood human being I felt in a, in a strange sense I could actually put more into this than I did into say Reasons to Stay Alive which was my direct experience Papyrus Author was designed and developed with the modern writer's needs wishes and preferences in mind from big structures right down to tiny details, every single feature of our software has been carefully and meticulously crafted in collaboration with authors. Take charge of your writing with the author interface, which gives you access to different elements of your story, such as characters, backgrounds, and narrative structure. Move sections of your writing seamlessly in the navigator and evaluate the complexity of your text with our expert style and readability analysis. Never worry about losing progress with automated backups. With Papyrus Author, you can be your own writer, editor, and publisher. The world of writing is about to change. Papyrus Author, the word processor for authors, has arrived on the international stage, unrivaled in its scope. It is the first software suite to unite every single step of creative writing. The vision behind Papyrus Author is to empower everyone with an idea to turn it into a great book for free. A word processing core that matured for over 10 years at its foundation, Papyrus Author goes beyond the text with its intuitive organizing layers for story, characters, notes, and research. The powerful style and readability analysis help raise manuscript quality. The inbuilt publication capabilities take the book directly to the reader with ebooks, docx, and print ready PDF. Visit papyrusauthor.com to get started today. This book, um, The Midnight Library, um, reminded me in, in some strange ways of Neil Gaiman's book, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And, you know, if you've listened to Neil talk about the genesis of that book, um, he says that he was writing um, his biography for his wife, uh, Amanda, while she was uh, out of the country working on a project of hers. And you know, so so he says that it's it it's about him. But when you read the book, it obviously ventures into fantasy. And there's, uh, you know, you, you can't really tell where the line is uh, between uh, him recalling his childhood and it just going into whimsical, fantastical areas. Uh, and and I felt this way about this book, um, the Midnight Library. Like like this is it. It felt so grounded, so real. Um, and then, it, but it, it obviously has fantastical elements and, um, you know, there's a, um, it, it's fascinating to think of fantasy. You know, we, we, we think of fantasy as like the Lord of the Rings and, and kind of high fantasy, and it's a different world with magical beings and creatures. Um, but there's something about taking, um, a story and people that feel very real and feel very grounded to where we are and just allowing them to kind of go where the boundaries of reality are blurred. Um, how do you think about fantasy and, and do you, um, do you consider what you write as fantasy? Um, where do those genre, uh, lines blur for you? Well, I like, I like it to actually exist kind of in the blur to actually be, um, part overtly real and, and realistic and, and, and to make the world recognizably our world in lots and lots of ways. But then within that, to sort of have some sort of dreamlike quality or to have some something where you kind of run out of reality. Uh, I've often very much have sat down to write a straightforwardly realist um, narrative. And then I get to like chapter three and I either get bored or frustrated or just want to do something. I feel like as a as a fiction writer, you you can literally, as I said before, you can literally go anywhere. So it, it feels almost like a waste to stay 
tied to this set version of reality. I feel like almost in 2020, reality itself is a kind of um, almost old-fashioned concept of what collective reality is because of the internet, because we're all living our own sort of subjective truths and our, our own subjective politics and everything's very sort of fractured in a way. So, so I feel that, that sort of 19th century idea like of being like a, I don't know, a Dickens or a Tolstoy where you could actually sum up the entire times and society you're in via the novel is almost, I think, an outdated kind of idea um, to do that. And I, I actually, it feels more natural and strangely more real to me to look at reality through the prism of a, a dream or a fantasy. So um, I, I, I think there's a space between, I don't feel like, I mean, obviously in Midnight Library in some ways she is in a very real world and then she's in a very fantastical world. But I feel when I'm writing it, I'm kind of writing in that in-between zone between um, reality and fantasy and the real and um, the dream world of the imagination. And even though you know we do massively live in this thing called reality uh, and we ha have our sort of laws of physics that guide us towards that, that reality i feel like there's so much we still don't know in terms of science in terms of like what, what quantum physics in terms of parallel life in terms of our own human brains you know there's so much unknown that um fantasy is a way of sort of potching at some deeper truth um it might not be the truth but it's it's a way to sort of like suggest that there's always slightly more out there than we know. Whereas if you said it within a very very uh, recognisably real reality, I feel as a writer. I mean, I love reading those books as a reader, but as a writer, for me, I like to sort of go off on, on different branches and explore what could be rather than what definitely is. In the beginning of the book, um, you introduce us to uh, Nora Seed right off the bat, and you take an interesting um, narrative style when you begin. Um, you know, the first chapter begins 19 years before she decided to die, Nora Seed, you know, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then the next chapter is, you know, 19 years later, and then it's, you know, 27 hours before she decided to die. Um you don't bury the lead. Um, you know, we we get a feeling right away that Nora um, is a certain type of person. She has certain feelings and we are immediately connected with her in um, in her, uh, you know, in, in her journey that, that she's on. Um, when you when you decided to tell Nora's story this way, um, what uh, what was the first inkling uh, as to what Nora was dealing with and, and how you would connect her with us, the readers? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, thing, the part of this book I wrestled with most was whether to have in the opening section, um, you know, whether to be so explicit about her depression, whether to be so foreboding about it with those, each section starting how many hours she has to, before she decides to die and this, that, and the other. And I, I reworked it a lot. Uh, for instance, that section before she reaches the Midnight Library, that was originally about 60 pages. I got it down to about 24, 25 pages, um, which I think hopefully is about the right balance. Um, and I, I, I thought, oh, is this going to be a bit... Mm, I worried actually if it was going to be sort of slightly triggering, you know, the fact that we've got, you know, 20, 24 hours before she dies or nine hours or whatever, each chapter starting like that. And then I thought, well, you know, I can remember what um, being deeply depressed was like. And it's kind of like you have that permanent sense of foreboding. Depression almost tells you, oh, this is going to happen. Everything's going to get worse, you know. In my case, it was saying, you won't be alive by the time you're 25, this, that, and the other. And it was kind of this constant, slightly melodramatic narrative and foreboding. And so I thought that would be a very simple way to convey that, you know, to have this sort of like countdown to her decision to die. Not to her death, but to her decision uh, to die. Uh, because that, for me, is what that kind of felt like. And I also felt as well, it would be very good for the reader to have some sense of where it was going in the sort of early stage of a novel, because 
if you're if you're writing about depression and you're writing about the character, yet you're wanting to do it in a way that um, is 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 not depressing but is engaging and hopefully sort of exciting and stuff like that. You have to have some sort of uh, forward momentum because depression is very often feels very flat by its nature, very sort of timeless. So to give it a slight ticking clock, I felt would map that sort of sense of capacity you have in the head, but also give the reader some sense that this is actually going somewhere. Sort of moment. Uh, Matt, I, I tried to find um, the uh, the quote I was looking for, and I, and I couldn't put my finger on it, but someone compared uh, the Midnight Library to a modern retelling of It's a Wonderful Life. Um, what do you think about that comparison? And, um, it, you know, while maybe on the surface I can definitely see some similarities, and I, I think I understand what the what the reviewer was talking about, but what do you think about comparisons like that? Well, I think in this case, that's a very sort of like conscious one. I mean, uh, the, the decision that, I mean, the, it's set in the, uh, largely set in the English town of Bedford, which is a real place, but it's also an echo of Bedford Falls in um Right. Life. And um, I've got a few nods in there. You know, in, in One Life, she's a rock musician. She's uh, written an album called Pottersville, which is obviously in it, a wonderful life reference. There's a character who crops up this sort of, light pastiche of a, a a sort of like hollywood sort of uh a superstar who, who's called ryan bailey which is obviously not to george bailey and there's little echoes that go through and but for me the inspiration for um it's a wonderful life was more sort of thematic it wasn't so much in the mechanics of, of the plot it was more about that theme about how how you, how you shift somebody's perspective uh, and so that's you know from my main influence from it's a wonderful life would be about that and also the fact that when you watch it, it's a wonderful life as i did last christmas to show my um, kids it and they actually did very well considering it's an old black and white movie they actually stuck with it and really enjoyed it but um it's actually a very dark film you know we think of it it wonderful. is <laughs> And we, we sort of like, if we haven't ever seen it or if we've only seen it a very long time ago, you, you remember the title, you remember the sort of hug James Stewart has at the end of his family, and we remember the ending, and we remember a few of the pithy lines in it. But we, we think of it as a, this very happy Christmassy movie. But for the bulk, for 90% of that film, it's, it's kind of in, in kind, of, kind of a dark place. And it touches on a lot of themes as depression and mental health issues, which were. were pretty much taboo to be talked about there suicide obviously um there's alcoholism touched upon there is um abuse uh, a young james stewart uh, the character george bailey uh, experiences at the hands of a boss physical abuse all kinds of stuff going on debt bankruptcy um you know uh, economic woes all of that and um so I suppose my inspiration from It's One for Life was, was to actually do something similar in the sense that you're taking a very uh, bleak situation, a very bleak life, and, and trying to find the hope within it. Because that, for me, is the most comforting thing. You know, you, if, you, if you're in a bit of a bad place or you, if you're struggling, you don't want to read about rainbows and unicorns and everything being a perfect, um, you know, golden meadow. You want to actually know that hope can be found within your situation and within the uh, you know uh, tough times. And so, what I like to do is to take a character, a central character, who is in the tough times, and to somehow make them rethink those tough times. And um, it's a wonderful life. Is possibly, even though it's cinema rather than uh, a novel, it's possibly the ultimate touchstone for those sort of stories. So yes, it was it was very consciously in my mind, along with um, some of the things two and other books and you know um the short, short stories of bullheads and all of that but yeah it's wonderful life it's great so yeah I, i'm i'm happy to be um you know referencing that <laughs> very just it's a very conscious echo 
Matt, when you're when you're uh, in the beginning stages of a book like The Midnight Library and you mm-hmm. you get the kind of overarching idea and, you know, OK, I, I know what this book is going to be about. I know what the character is going to be about. Um, how much of a plan do you follow uh, in in the the writing of that book? Um, are, are you a planner up front or, or are you discovering the story as you write it? I'm really not so much a planner in the literal sense of writing it down. I think obviously some sort of planning goes on in terms of my mind, and it's nice to have a sense of where you are going, um, even if you don't know all the sort of destinations you will pass on your way there. Um, so I'm not really a planner. You know, I, I see, uh, I, I hear of thriller writers who have these sort of like uh, flow charts and they have these complex uh, diagrams and whiteboards and stuff like it's a, a sort of police headquarters and i would love to be a bit more like that but the way i write is i have to sort of write it i have to, to actually know what i'm writing i have to kind of just be in the act of writing i can't sort of step outside it at the start and, and do a list of chapter one chapter two chapter three or any of that stuff um, so I, I write non-chronologically, for instance. So if I've got a good scene in mind, it's probably a scene that will happen halfway through the story. I start with that scene and then sort of build around around it and go backwards and forwards in time and, and stuff like that. And it can make editing quite a tricksy process where you get all kinds of things wrong in terms of timing and place and weather and all those sort of boring logical setting stuff. Um, but I think ultimately it makes it for me a better story because I, I've written what I want to write within that moment. So you, you end up hopefully that way with less um, filler, less sort of getting from A to B because you, you're always trying to write the most exciting scene at that. Matt, the Midnight Library was recently picked as a Good Morning America book club pick. Um, you know the the book is. Um, um, at, it really covers some some heavy um, subject matter, uh, but in a very entertaining way, which you know sounds weird to say when you say that out loud. Um, but how does it feel to know that your book has connected so deeply with such a big reading audience? Well, it's always lovely when when that happens and people respond well to it, and um, you know, I'm not one of those writers who says, "Oh, I, I just write." for myself or you know i i definitely write to be read and i i think there's no shame in that and um i, I think it i think it's great and this was, was interestingly a book that i mentioned a lot on social media as i was writing it and i was getting sort of readers comments back and there's that excitement about the idea and the that really helped fuel it and they even helped come up with the title because i had two titles I had midnight library or the midnight library which doesn't sound like a big difference but for me i was really agonizing about whether it should have a a definite article at the start of it and um yeah it was an overwhelming a decision that it should be there and i thought yeah well that makes it more sort of classic uh, sounding and um so yeah no it's great to have that sort of um connection with readers and, and that the fact that they're um enjoying it and that they're, they're seeing it as an enjoyable read but also you know uh helping them have some sort of perspective well it is nice because that's what i i try to do while writing it i try to write it almost as a sort of active self therapy to try and make me feel um better about what i've got and what i haven't got and the regrets and various things like well the new book is out everywhere now the midnight library um we're going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode matt to make it easy for people to find it um i started listening to the audio book yesterday uh, after i had already read the uh, the arc that your publisher sent me but i started listening to the audio book and it is fascinating it is uh, amazing and a completely different experience uh so i highly recommend the audio as well i'm going to finish it today or tomorrow and uh just loving it um Matt, uh, where can people find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you've done? Um, well, I'm really active, probably too active on social media. I, I'm on Instagram and Twitter mainly. I'm also on Facebook, but I have used Facebook. But I'm Matt Haig one H A I G one on uh, Twitter, and Matt Z or Z Haig H A I G on Instagram too. 
Excellent. We'll put links to those as well. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of The Midnight Library, and uh, we wish you uh, much continued success on the book. Thank you, Hank. Very kind. That was a pleasure. And we'll cut it right there. Uh, that was fantastic, Matt. Thank you. Brilliant, Hank. Thanks for having me. Yes. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. It draws on tried-and-true, tested theory that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Do you ever wonder if a person's critical thinking comes at the expense of their own happiness? Is it possible to be very happy and still practice excellent discernment? I used to wonder the same thing. Then I discovered the Trouble in Paradise podcast with Nigel Kent and Jasmine Starr, where they laugh as well as think about conspiracy theories and unexplained phenomena without ever getting bogged down in the age-old tug-of-war between logic and feeling. The Trouble in Paradise podcast is a joyful program for critical thinkers who have a sense of humor. Join Nigel and Jasmine as they probe the intriguing and wacky culture of odd occurrences, strange news, and ridiculous coincidences on this hilariously intelligent podcast. Trouble in Paradise on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Stitcher. Follow at TipCast239 on Twitter. Trouble in Paradise with Nigel Ken and Jasmine Starr, a happy podcast for critical thinkers like you.